Professor Paul is an executive director of the European, European Society of Industrial Mathematics. Excellent. Okay, so this, uh, I think this is not in the uh, program, so I will uh, try uh, and be uh, brief. Um, so, as uh, uh, Professor Sachana said, I am uh, I'm a member of the MyNet uh, Steering Committee, uh, and I'm also uh, Executive uh, Director of the uh, Consortium for uh, Industrial and Applied Mathematics. And um, so, um, the uh, interesting word here in the title is uh, collaborative, uh, I think, because mathematics traditionally is a subject for introvert, lonely uh, people uh, who are not used to working uh, in groups. But uh, some interesting things can happen when you start uh, to work uh, in groups. So this is all about industrial mathematics in, in Europe. Let's see. <laughs> Um, and uh, so I will brief briefly talk about uh, ECMI, the uh, consortium, and then I will give some examples uh, from um, uh, from study groups, uh, from actual uh, problem solving uh, that we have done. But first, about uh, ECMI. It began in the 1960s, and I don't know, only very few people in this room were alive in the 1960s, uh, but... Um, these two gentlemen uh, were, and um, and being uh, British, uh, they liked uh, to have bets and challenges, and their industrial contacts would often say to them, "You think you are so clever, but um, but can you can you solve my problem?" Uh, and they would say, "Yes, we can," and the industry would say, "No, you cannot." And they eventually uh, they started having these meetings where they uh, were challenged by industry to actually do some uh, useful computations and uh, calculations. And this began to be popular in the 1970s and the 1980s in, uh, in, uh, in England and in the UK. And uh, people, uh, applied mathematicians from other countries in Europe started to attend. And uh, eventually, in uh, 1985, uh, a bunch of these people, or just a handful, really, of these people decided that they, they should have a regular network, a contact uh, form. So this, they formed uh, the European uh, Consortium. Now, I want to emphasize uh, that this is totally disconnected uh, from the EU. So... Uh, ECMI is a grassroots non-profit organization. It is simply a a a club, a, a, a well, a consortium, a network among universities. So they don't have any money, and so to to get money, for instance, for events like this, sometimes they have to go to the EU and form sub networks like MyNet. Uh, and the whole purpose is uh, simply to share among European uh, universities uh, standards for education, for instance, of uh, young people like you, and uh, also have share experiences with industry uh, cooperation. So there's a, there's a famous mission statement that is to educate a new generation of industrial uh, mathematicians to uh, promote the use of mathematics uh, in, in, in society. In other words, um, uh, I mean, one thing is to have a factory where you go every day and turn a handle and produce something because the factory was already built for you. A completely different thing is to think about uh, new ideas and innovative uh, processes. And for this, you need uh, mathematics. And this uh, gives you uh, advantage uh, and a great economic uh, stimulus. And eventually also uh, simply to do this on a European uh, scale. So as I said, in 1987, uh, there were just a handful of uh, ECMI uh, nodes. Uh, today, uh, there's many more. So this is my point about uh, ECMI being an uh, 
a growing uh, a growing uh, activity uh, in Europe, and we expect uh, over the years uh, many more dots on this uh, map, which um, you all know and love. And of course, also here there's a web page um, that you can. So the domain name of mathematics was taken, and the, actually also I think the domain called just ECMI was also taken for some reason. And so, so it's a little lengthy ECMI industrial math dot uh, org, but you can Google it and you will find it. So uh, to repeat myself, uh, education is a top priority with ECMI and, and <coughs> If you are an official member of ECMI, that means that your university uh, provides a standardized education in industrial uh, mathematics. You have a curriculum in industrial mathematics uh, that follows some uh, set rules uh, determined by uh, ECMI, uh, and then uh, you are a teaching center and your master students uh, can get a certificate uh, when they graduate, that uh, not only are they a master student of your university, but they have also followed the official ECMI rules, and so they have a stamp that they are ECMI uh, certified industrial uh, mathematicians. Then there's another uh, activity, uh, which is the modeling camps, or the modeling weeks, which is something like what we're doing this week. So, as you can see, students come from all over Europe to spend a week working in small, uh, as much as possible, multinational groups uh, on problems that are based on uh, real-life uh, problems. So, every other year, ECMI has a conference. In 2016, it was in Santiago de Compostela. Next, no, this year, this year, it will be in Budapest in June. And uh, there's uh, dissemination activities. Uh, so ECMI runs uh, journals. Uh, there's a website, as you saw. It gives out uh, prizes. Uh, and we have prize winners uh, in our uh, group. Uh, there's also research activity within uh, ECMI. So ECMI organizes what's called uh, special interest groups. Um, uh, around particular uh, research uh, topics. And then um, uh, ECMI coordinates uh, the uh, standardized uh, so-called uh, European study groups with industry, which is something essentially like the modeling camps, except that uh, it is uh, not so much for students, but uh, for uh, ac academics, uh, professional um, people uh, who uh, have these uh, week-long workshops uh, where they solve uh, problems associated with uh, with uh, with the industry, and I will give you some examples uh, of these. Uh, and this is where, so let's see, I started uh, doing these uh, 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 European study groups with industry in 1998, uh, and I think I have attended um, about. 50 of them in various uh, countries in various uh, formats and it will take a long time to tell the story of all the problems in all the study groups so I have selected uh, just a few but um, let me just mention before I stop uh, this part of the talk that um, there, there are these uh, sub networks that have been spawned out of, uh, of uh, ECMI one is EU MathSyn, which is very focused on getting uh, money out of EU. In fact, both of them are. Uh, uh, but MyNet is the most uh, successful one, and MyNet is the one uh, who uh, starts to uh, create uh, new industrial math uh, activities in, in countries uh, like Macedonia. Okay, so that was the first part of my talk. So now comes the second part of my talk. And I will try and be brief. I will give you four examples, four of my favorite examples of, of uh, study group uh, problems. So uh, this was the f one of the problems brought to the first Danish uh, study group by uh, Danfoss. 
Danfoss is a Danish company who makes uh, compressors. For instance, inside uh, here is a uh, compressor running uh, air and it makes some noise and Danfoss uh, is always interested in new designs for compressors and they had come across the design of uh, uh, a, a patent that had uh, never been used but someone, a French engineer, had taken out uh, uh, a patent in 1905 um, on what is uh, called the scroll compressor. So you've all learned in geometry courses about uh, spirals. And I want you to imagine uh, two spirals on top of each other and one of them shifted uh, a little bit. Here's a picture, I hope, that you can see of one of them. And uh, originally this was made into a GIF but um, the way this compressor works is the blue spiral is, ro is, is, mo is moving in a circular uh, motion and the yellow spiral is fixed. What happens then is that air is sucked in here and then uh, sort of squashed through these uh, channels into the inner chamber and compressed in this way. And uh, Danfoss uh, needed some way of experimenting with this design to make uh, specific uh, types of uh, compressors. It turns out uh, this was just what uh, the geometers uh, who taught uh, geometry uh, and, uh, and technical drawing uh, was in search of because it's an example where uh, a uh, very specific representation for a curve, namely uh, the connection between arc length and tangent uh, direction uh, is needed and it turned out you can describe the action of the spiral compressor beautifully in terms of polynomial uh, expressions uh, in terms of this. This is a non-technical talk uh, and all I will say is that um, uh, we, we ended up giving Danfoss a very simple equation so on literally on the back of an envelope they could solve uh, their uh, equations and they even made a prototype and uh, there was a publication that uh, even made the, the front page of uh, Siam uh, Review uh, back in 2001. Um, if you are a rock star, you want to be on the cover of Rolling Stones uh, magazine. If you are an industrial mathematician, you want to be on the cover of Siam uh, Review. And uh, so uh, we were very happy uh, with that. So uh, my second example uh, is a problem that uh, we had at one of the British uh, study groups. So imagine an office building. Uh, so it's a big building, various offices uh, of companies in the building. They all have wireless networks uh, running, but they would really want not to share their wireless network with the other guys. And so uh, what they would, what they asked us was, um, if you want uh, adjacent companies to have different frequencies, how many frequencies do you need? This is a combinatorial uh, problem, um, and really it is a graph theoretical uh, problem, because you can construct a, a graph and then you want to have the connecting uh, uh, edges to have different uh, values or different colors, so it really is what you can call a graph uh, coloring uh, problems. Uh, each domain is a node on a graph and the edges uh, need to carry uh, different uh, values. Um, and so from the graph theoretical point of view, this is simply to uh, calculate in that type of, uh, of uh, setting what is called the chromatic number. How many colors do you need uh, to uh, color uh, differently the edges on a uh, graph. Um, and uh, this can be worked out. It turns out to be actually an unbounded uh, thing. For a while we thought we could give a specific number because it's just a 3D problem, but there was always more and more complex uh, geometries and uh, eventually we figured out that there was a lower bound where n is the number of companies in the building, then uh, the number of different frequencies that you need will grow at least as fast as, I don't know if you can see it uh, in the back, but um, 
let me uh, just state here the chromatic number has a lower bound with, which increases within and uh, there's no upper bound uh, but in practice actually you can get away with five it turns out for most for most normal layouts of office buildings you can get away with five but uh, it led to interesting questions for the graph theorists namely uh, here's the uh, estimate and so this is the famous uh, lower bound uh, and this is the upper bound and so uh, it's no surprise you all recognize this as an increasing function this is also in principle an increasing function but it is the slowest increasing function that I have ever seen in my uh, life uh, because log log n divided by log 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 n is so flat that you need an office buildings with billions of offices before it exceeds I think five or something like this it is so flat and uh, and so this gap here is too wide and so uh, it's an open question to increase to uh, increase this um, uh, bound but nobody knows uh, how to do this and my point is that sometimes uh, interactions with industry generates new mathematical uh, problems that are mostly of interest for mathematicians. My third problem is an unsolved uh, problem uh, also. Lego came to us and asked us uh, how to build with Lego bricks and of course we said to them you, you don't know how to build with Lego bricks and they and they said uh, not uh, really I'm talking about Lego uh, bricks but their point was the following every time they make a new Lego uh, model of a spaceship or a pirate uh, ship or something um, they also need to make uh, uh, assembly instructions so they need to, and if you have ever played, have you ever played with Lego? You, you must have, right? And so you open the box and you pull out the instructions and they are not written in any language. Uh, they are just pictures. They are just pictures saying, put out some of these, then on top of that, and then, and then, and then, and so who makes the instructions? And uh, apparently they're made by uh, professional uh, builders who see the picture and then they do it and then they write down what they do and Lego's problem to the study group was can you not make this automatic can you not produce an algorithm that makes the building instructions from the shape so this was really a question in algorithmic uh, theory given the 3d shape what is the what is the best uh, way of putting this together as a Lego model this turned out to be extraordinarily difficult. So um, we managed over the week to uh, show that uh, if you wanted to build a box or you wanted to build a wall, then you could provide uh, algorithms for the best uh, building. Where well, this was not so interesting for Lego because they wanted spaceships and pirate ships and uh, stuff like this. Um, so at the end of the day, we uh, conjectured that uh, the solution to this problem was probably uh, an NP uh, type uh, algorithm. They should not fire the people who uh, made the uh, instructions because it is impossible for computers, uh, it was back then and probably also today, to solve uh, the problem. This has generated a lot of interest also among uh, algorithm uh, experts uh, because um, uh, it is very challenging and there has been since this problem there has been some progress in the area but it's the complete problem is still uh, unsolved so um, so that was an interesting uh, thing and finally uh, the penguins so along with coffee I think th this is one of the uh, happier um, uh, problems so uh, Bristol Zoo which is not an industry but still uh, they are a company uh, came to us and said um, we want to save this particular type of African penguin uh, which is a threatened species and we do it by uh, taking when they lay an egg 
we take the eggs and we put them in an incubator, you know, one of these machines where they put chicken eggs uh, also, but their success rate was not very good. For some reason, the machine which is designed to make uh, uh, eggs for, for chicken uh, does not work on penguin eggs. And Bristol Zoo wanted to know why. And uh, if, as soon as you knew why, then you could probably <coughs> provide a solution. We, they knew that the penguins uh, turn their eggs. So when you put an egg in one of these machines, they actually placed on uh, little rollers and the rollers slowly turn uh, the eggs because we know that birds uh, do that. It's not particularly known why exactly they do that. And we, they thought the secret was to be able to scale uh, the frequency of this motion to penguin size uh, from uh, chicken size. So of course we consider a spherical egg. This is a joke, you're supposed to laugh, uh, but uh, I will tell you later why uh, the spherical shape is uh, a joke. But, uh, but here's a spherical egg, it has the embryo, it has the egg white and it has the yolk. And I will fast forward now to the uh, solution. The solution uh, was that the, um, if you work out the rotational time scale of um, of uh, the egg, you find uh, a value uh, which is observed in uh, nature, namely about a thousand uh, seconds. Uh, and so it has to do with uh, what happens uh, to the egg yolk uh, when you uh, return, when you rotate uh, the egg. And we were able to scale um, that. And the, uh, the explanation is that when the embryo uh, grows, it depletes the egg yolk of nutrients, and so when when there are no more nutrients left here, uh, the embryo cannot grow. And uh, so when you turn the eggs, you kind of uh, thin out this uh, region and gives the uh, embryo access to fresh nutrients. And so you, if you do this at the right uh, frequency, then the egg will continue uh, to grow. So we wrote a report. We couldn't help making uh, jokes in the <laughs> title uh, also because we thought this was intensely funny. And of course the penguins know what to do, but they don't know any mathematics. So no penguin has ever studied uh, this uh, uh, equation. And then we gave the report to the zoo and then we waited. And then after about six months, the zoo said, now they had uh, penguins all over the place. Uh, so uh, we became uh, godfathers of a new generation of uh, African uh, penguins. So this was a very happy uh, success uh, story. So I think I have definitely overstated my uh, time. Uh, so uh, thank you for listening to me and uh, back to the organizers. Thank you.